Hi everyone, I'm Jean-Marc Voyadzis. I'm a neurosurgeon specializing in both brain and spinal surgery. And today what I want to talk to you about is a, one of the more common conditions that we treat and one of the more common surgeries that we do in neurosurgery, and that's lumbar discectomy. First, I'll review a little bit of basic spinal anatomy, and then I'll discuss the reasons for which we do lumbar discectomy surgery. I'll go over the technique of lumbar discectomy surgery. I'll review the risks associated with this operation and we'll go over the expected recovery from this type of surgery. First, a quick review of spinal anatomy. This is a model of the lumbar spine, which refers to the lower back. We typically have five lumbar vertebrae numbered top to bottom, lumbar one, all the way down to lumbar five. And the bony vertebrae of the lumbar spine represent the building blocks of the spinal column. And between the bony vertebrae of the lumbar spine, we have these discs that are natural shock absorbers. They're represented in blue. Those discs play a role in shock absorption every day of our lives, and they also play a role in motion and stability of our spinal column, our ability to twist and turn and move around. Behind the discs lies the spinal canal that contains the spinal nerves, and those nerves essentially travel down the canal of the lower back and then go into our legs and give our legs feeling and strength. As we get older, our discs can start wearing out, and typically they'll lose their shock absorbing quality and start to diminish in their natural height. And when they do that, they can start collapsing backwards, and that's what we call a disc bulge or a disc protrusion. On occasion, a piece of the disc can get detached from the disc space itself and herniate backwards into the spinal canal and displace the spinal nerves. The typical symptoms that come from a lumbar disc herniation are pain that travels down the leg and it can be associated with a alteration in sensation such as tingling or even numbness down the leg. When severe it can also be associated with weakness in the leg or the foot. Now the great majority of disc herniations can be treated non-operatively meaning that there are a series of conservative treatment modalities that we recommend. First, a period of rest can ease the symptoms of lumbar disc herniations. Avoiding strenuous physical activity, certain medications can help in the short term, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxants, or if the pain is severe, then occasionally we prescribe a very short course of opioids. Physical therapy for mild to moderate lumbar disc herniations can be very helpful. This involves strengthening the core, the abdominal muscles in the front, and the paraspinal muscles in the back which can help offload the discs and ease the pain. When the pain is quite severe we can also consider epidural steroid injections. That's typically done by a pain management specialist and it involves guiding a needle in your lower back while you're laying on your belly with an x-ray machine and injecting steroids or numbing medicine to ease the pain. And all these treatment modalities can certainly help for a period of time while we hope that the piece of the disc that herniated or the part of the disc that's bulging gets smaller over time. And it can certainly do that in many circumstances. Unfortunately, not all disc herniations get better on their own, and that's when we consider lumbar discectomy surgery. So we typically recommend surgery if the pain is severe and has been resistant to a number of conservative measures that we talked about, or if there's a progressive neurological deficit, such as persistent tingling or numbness or significant weakness in the leg or the foot. Lumbar discectomy surgery is typically a one-hour surgery and it's usually outpatient surgery, meaning that most patients can go home the same day. Of course, some patients who are unhealthy or have multiple medical problems will generally recommend that they stay in the hospital for observation. The way the surgery is performed is patients undergo general anesthesia and we lay them on their belly in the operating room. The incision typically is the size of my nail. It's a very, very small incision. And I usually work through a working portal and I bring a microscope in. And what we essentially do is we create a little opening in the bony wall of the spinal canal that's called a lamina. And creating a little opening is called a laminotomy. And that gains us access to the spinal canal. We find the nerve that's pinched, protect it, get around it, and pull out just the piece of the disc that's herniating and pinching the nerve. Many patients get significant relief of their leg symptoms within hours to days of surgery. And the success rate of this operation is typically around 90 to 95 percent in terms of the ability of the surgery to relieve the leg symptoms that we talked about. Surgery in general of this kind is not as effective in relieving back pain as it is in relieving leg symptoms. 
Therefore, if you present with mostly back pain, in general, a lumbar discectomy surgery is not going to be effective. While the surgery is 90 to 95% effective, it also means that there's a 5 to 10% chance that the surgery is not effective. And that's a disappointing outcome for patients, as it is for the physicians who are treating you. But the point is that no operation is 100% guarantee. And one of the reasons for that is that sometimes the nerve has been severely damaged or it's been compressed or impinged upon for too long and we essentially get to it too late. In terms of the recovery, patients have some surgery pain for several days to several weeks at the most. Everybody's different in the way they respond to pain. Most people require some narcotics and a muscle relaxant for several days to a week and then they can quickly wean themselves off. We do impose physical restrictions after this type of surgery, meaning in general we don't like strenuous physical activity for about four to six weeks. That means no heavy lifting, typically over five to 10 pounds, no repetitive bending or twisting or any high impact activities. What we want to do is let the body heal and there's a ligament that contains the disc that has to heal and it takes a good four to six weeks for that ligament to regain a lot of its tensile strength. And that's the reason for which we recommend physical restrictions after surgery. Usually at the four to six week mark, we begin some physical therapy to strengthen the core and a lot of the physical restrictions are lifted. And once you're healed from this, you have no significant restrictions in general. Now everybody's a little different in their underlying conditions as well. The risks of this operation are as follows. Every surgery carries a risk of infection, but typically the risk of infection is usually less than 1%. Now there are some patients who are at a slightly higher risk of infection due to certain medical conditions, but in general the infection rate is quite low. There's minimal bleeding from surgery because the incision is so small. The nerves lay in a sac that contains spinal fluid. And in doing the surgery, on occasion there can be a little opening of that sac during surgery, which can cause a spinal fluid leakage. Now we take these leakages seriously because if they persist after surgery, they can cause headaches or even a severe wound infection. The rate of a spinal fluid leakage from this surgery is typically around five to 10%. If it happens in surgery, we can see it, we can typically fix it, and it's usually inconsequential. Sometimes we'll recommend a period of flat bed rest, either at home or in the hospital, for several days prior to getting back on your feet. Any operation of the spine carries a risk of nerve injury. The risk of a severe nerve injury from this operation is extremely low. It's usually less than 1%. But a nerve injury can mean persistent pain in the leg or persistent tingling or numbness or even weakness. A severe injury can even produce paralysis. There are minor risks related to general anesthesia that goes along with any operation. And finally, because the disc is herniated, in general, that's a sign that the disc itself is starting to wear out. And there is a chance in the future that the disc could continue to wear out and can herniate again. And typically the risk of that is usually around five to 10%.